Well, good morning again, everybody. We're so glad you're here with us. As you see, we are continuing in our spectator series. And the subtitle of today is The Devil Made Me Do It. And I, you may have never said those words, but it's a lot easier to blame somebody for something we've done than just to take ownership of it. And so if you've missed any of this series, all of these are online. They're on our Facebook or on our website. Go back and listen to them because we want you to get caught up. And here's the reason why. We're spending this entire year on spiritual formation. And so in March, we are going to kick off some spiritual practices that we're not only going to be being taught about here on the stage as our church around the stage, but in our city life communities, we're actually going to be putting these into play with some very real and practical things, okay? And so today, as we start to think through that process, the devil made me do it. I want you to think about that in your life. Like, how easy is it for you to own the things you've done or is it so much easier just to like be able to look and even creatively point to somebody else that they've actually caused you to do this thing, okay? Our world is designed for comfort, ease, and simplicity. Our entire existence can be streamlined for complete and total ease of use and hardly any effort on our part. Think about the things that we love and can have. We can have homes where we rarely have to touch anything other than our phone. We can control all of our lights, our door locks, our showers and toilets, our heats and our air all from our phone. Pretty nice, actually, right? We don't have to drive anymore, really. We get out on the road, punch in our destination, sit in the seat and let the car drive. You don't even have to maintain it. You just plug it in. Because everything is moving towards ease for us. We never have to go to a store or restaurant or movie theater again. You can order your food, a birthday gift, your favorite book, or even a car, and someone will bring it to you. (laughs) All of this is to appeal to the comfort and ease of our life. Now, but it does cost us something. We just don't typically think about it as very difficult. It costs us money, so we make more of it so we can have more comfort. But this doesn't seem to bother us because we don't necessarily feel the weight of that all that much, right? Everything costs us something monetarily this day and age. So it just depends on how much you want to pay for your level of comfort. So when we look at this as costing us something, it doesn't really equate to the more difficult things we would do in life that may cost us something physically or may cost us a job, right? There is a difference here. But if you would stop and understand the way that you have to manipulate your life to have the comforts that you have, you'll realize this may cost you more than you know. For example, I have a friend who door dashed 400 plus times last year. There's 365 days in the year. You did hear that right. 400 plus, and I think it was near 450, And he was like, it was fine. I had the money to do it. So it didn't really cost him anything. He could have actually purchased the whole entire restaurant from the fees and the tips. But in his mind, it didn't really cost him anything because he didn't feel the weight of all of that comfort. But see, this creates a tension in us. To move from a spectator or believer to follower is going to be uncomfortable. There is no app for this. I mean, there technically is like the U version Bible app, but you know what I mean. <laughs> no one can deliver godliness to you at your door or bring you the right answers or help you fight temptations at the push of a button. But there is hope because God gives a greater grace. Now, we're living in a tension in our lives today unlike ever before. Now, I don't know if you're like me. A lot of times we just exist in life. We do the things we do without ever questioning them. But I like to know the answers to questions. So I'm a very thorough person. I do study. I do research. I've never seen a chart I didn't like as far as statistics go. That's just me, okay? Now, for you, you may just be fine going along life, doing the things that you've always done, and not honestly understanding why. But let me tell you where I think a lot of this tension has come from. We've been raised in an area of existentialism, which we've been talking about recently, that gained rapid popularity after World War II in France and quickly made its way around the globe. In essence, existentialism is no one, no teacher, no authority, and no God can tell me what I should do with my life. I will decide that for myself. That's existentialism uh, in a nutshell. We are told when we are kids that we can do whatever we want in life or be whoever we want, but that isn't actual reality for most of us. It's hard to get an accurate number on this because the surveys are all over the place, but it ranges from 6% of us um, are doing what we actually wanted to do as a child as high as 40%, which I think is way too high. 
But where did this all come from and why is it actually a problem today? Because philosophy and reality don't actually tend to match up very much. So the philosophical thought behind existentialism from a lot of philosophers who say, you determine your own path in life, nobody is going to tell you anything different, it creates tension when you hit the real world because those things typically don't match up. And so we're caught in this tension. So the French philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre was a prominent voice in existentialism and his works are still used today. Here are his thoughts. You ready? Because we have freedom, it makes us miserable people, not solely because life is miserable, but because we are condemned to be free. Does that make sense to anyone else? It doesn't mean either, but this is a very regarded thought. He goes on to say, there is no fixed design for how a human being should be and no God to give us a purpose. Therefore, the onus for defining ourselves and by extension humanity falls squarely on our shoulders. This lack of predesigned, predefined purpose, along with an absurd existence that presents to us infinite choices, is what Sartre attributes to the anguish of freedom. That part, I may be able to get on board with a little bit. When you have a myriad of things in front of you, there's a bit of anguish in choosing which one to do, right? He calls that the anguish of freedom. But he goes on to say, with nothing to restrict us, we have the choice to take actions to become who we want to be and lead the life we want to live. Now, that sounds somewhat normal, although he was very against capitalism and greatly admired Marxist theology and leaders like Fidel Castro and Che Guevara who were making their country communist. Does that not seem odd to anyone else? (laughs) He wants you to have full choice and freedom, do whatever you want to do, although he wants you to be told what to do by a communist society. These things clash in the middle and don't make any sense. But we get stuck in the thought process of, yeah, I'll do whatever I want and no one can tell me otherwise, but we don't ever finish the rest of the thought or the rest of the idea of what this person was thinking. So it leaves us in attention. Here's our attention. This type of philosophy has been subtly taught and understood by most of us. Think about this. How many well-intentioned parents have said, you can be whatever you want to be. You can be an astronaut, a brain surgeon, an owner of a huge company. You can even be president one day. Don't raise your hand if you've said it. I've said it, more than likely. My kids are none of those things. Good kids have great jobs, but they're not those things. See, what happens is is these kind of thoughts and these ideas and these understandings, they come into our thought where unknowingly we're even buying in, we're even telling everybody else this, and then it creates even greater tension for us when we're faced with the reality that those things aren't going to happen. Why would we not say like, you know what? You could be one of the greatest used car salesmen ever to live. You could be a driver that cleans out porta potties. You could even be an Uber driver that takes DoorDash to someone 400 times. You could be a server, an electrician. You could fix cell phones, work in retail. You could be a real estate agent, a carpenter. Maybe you could even own your own business, be a politician, a doctor, or a lawyer. Why don't we start down in the reality of what most of us are going to do with our lives and then work up from there? (laughs) It's because we have the right idea behind us. None of us are ill-intentioned in making our kids think they can be something that they more than likely will not be. But this all lives inside of this philosophy. Why does this become a tension for us when we're saying, hey, we want you to move from just believing in Jesus to actually following what he said? Attention becomes living in our own thoughts and frustrations of, I thought I could do anything I wanted or be anything I wanted, but that's not my reality, and that frustrates us. Especially when you've shown that if you surrender your life to Jesus, he will give you all the things you're really searching for, but that it will require you to lay down your life as he laid down his, him in death and us in desire. See, church, this is where the tension is going to grow in us. 
Because here's where most of Christianity is okay being. I do. I do want to follow Jesus. But all of these things that the world is telling me that I can and should have, I also want those too. And so what I want you to realize is that we are put in this constant crisis that you have to deal with. Here's, here's, here, here's a statement I'm confident enough to make. You have to deal with this until you understand what Jesus said is actually what you're looking for. And then I'm pretty confident you won't have to deal with that much after that. When I came to that reality in my life, that the things of Jesus were more important to me than the things of the world, the things that I was actually searching for were found in Jesus, not the world, I don't really struggle with that anymore. Because there was something that happened in my mind where I said, okay, this is actually it. I don't have to pursue these things any longer. And so these aren't a constant struggle for me anymore. Do they creep their head up from time to time? Yeah, absolutely. They didn't just like magically go away. But what I want you to hear from me and what I want you to understand is there's a point where you can get to where this will not be a minute-by-minute struggle for you. But let me read this statement to you one more time. The tension becomes living in our own thoughts and frustrations of, I thought I could do anything I wanted or be anything I wanted. But that's not the reality for most of us, and it frustrates us, especially when you hear me say that if you surrender your life to Jesus, this is our first issue with this. You want me to surrender everything? Everything I've worked so hard for, everything that I've accumulated, everything that I have set for my future, you want me to surrender all of that? This is the tension in the rub. So when you have to surrender your life to Jesus, but the promise and the guarantee is he'll give you all the things you're really searching for, but it will require you to lay your life down as he laid his down. See, this is our tension. Now, let's go to Scripture and see what we're kind of exposed to here just a little bit. We're going to be in James 4, verses 1 through 8. And we're going to walk through this just kind of slowly, and then we're going to do something practical at the end, and then we're going to be on our way today. But he starts out with a question that is provocative, and I think we need to answer He says, what is the source of wars and fights among you? It's a really intentional question by James. I want you to think about the things that like cause turmoil inside of you. And I just want you to try to answer this, okay? What what is the source of wars and fights among you? And then he makes a statement. Don't they come from your passions that wage war within you? Well, kind of another question. So he has this twofold understanding and thought, okay? So I want you to identify right now the things that cause anxiety, worry, stress inside of you, okay? For a lot of us, it's going to be money, right? It's going to be money, it's going to be comfort, and it's going to be acceptance at some level in our life. Those are the three big ones for us. But money, man, that's the big, big one, isn't it? And so what happens is is if you would take money and you would put it here and you would then lay it over your life, then come back to this question, what is the source of wars and fights among you? When you hear me say you should surrender all of your life and money's the thing, what happens inside of you? There's a tension that starts to well up. There's something that starts to go, oh gosh, you had me up till this, man, like right? And then there's this fighting, and then there's this war, and then we're like, why? What, what, what is causing this tension inside of me? But then the question answers our question. Don't they come from your passions to wage war within you? See, you live in a world that constantly is going to appeal to your flesh. Is there anything wrong with pulling out your phone, walking in the bathroom and show your buddy, hey, watch this, isn't that cool? I just flushed my toilet with my phone. Is there anything wrong with that? No, not at all. But you got to buy a pretty expensive toilet and then buy this app and then all of that. Is there anything wrong with that? No, but if that's the idea and the comfort of your life, and then God forbid you'd have to walk over and do this and live in poverty. I mean, I don't, (laughs) I don't know what we'll do with this. (laughs) But the question becomes like, how much do I want to arrange my life to live in the comforts that I am being told I need? And 
I get it. We love these. And there's nothing wrong with them. But what I want you to see is this is what causes the quarrels and the fights inside of you. Because you're going to be constantly left with a choice. Because the reality is most of us are not going to get the privilege to be millionaires to just give all of our money away but have some comforts too. We're going to have to work really hard for that stuff. We're going to have to compromise along the way. We're going to have to have this stuff that we wouldn't get most of us, if Jesus is like, hey, I I want you to surrender all of it to me. Now, I've known a few Christian multimillionaires, some nearing the billion mark, and I assure you they tried to give more away than they could keep, and God just continually kept blessing them. Now, we would all go, oh, I would do the same thing. After I bought a private island, and I bought a jet, and I... (laughs) Because the reality is, for most of us, that's a really big struggle, isn't it? This isn't a money talk at all. But there's no irony that when Jesus was here on earth, he taught more about money than he did heaven and hell combined. Because he knew this is going to be the thing that gets us, right? Now, if you're contemplating this question in verse 1, and what I want you to see is where do these passions and desires come from? Well, they come from childhood. They come from what you are developed to think is important in life. And so we go back to this existentialism that has been around for literally hundreds and hundreds of years, brought into the mainstream post-World War II, brought into mainstream ideology and thought where we even reuse those words and we don't even understand it, and we are literally just causing unnecessary tension for ourselves all the time. And we're not even wrong a lot of times. We can decide a lot of things. We do have the freedom to do a lot of things. But when this creeps down into be who we are as people, man, to know that we have to surrender all of that to Jesus is just, man, that's just a lot. That's too much. Look at verse 2. Verse 2 says, you desire and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and wage war. That's a, that's a pretty uh, intentional verse, isn't it? So here's where I want to come back, and I want you to realize that we as followers of Jesus, as you surrender to him, what you're saying is, I believe not only you can forgive all of my sin, you can set me free, but everything I'm looking for in this world is found in you. But what happens? We move back to our old ways of doing things, and then we desire, and we do not have, so we murder. Now, Jesus said, if you hate someone in your heart, you've already committed murder in your heart. So we're not talking about physical murder, although that has happened. What we're talking about is that anger, that angst, that anxiety, and that hate that would ultimately arise in your heart by seeing something someone else has and being frustrated you don't have it. And so what happens is this tension that just constantly comes against us. Now, you may be saying, I thought we were talking about spiritual warfare. We are, but you have to actually decipher what is you causing this grief and pain in your life or the enemy who is actually attacking you and in the middle of a spiritual warfare battle. And they do actually go together, church. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. That fighting is the idea of I will do anything I can to get what I want. I'll work as much as I need to. I'll have as many jobs as I need to. I will sacrifice what I need to get what I want. Quarreling, but then it kind of shifts gears. You do not have because you do not ask. For those of you that are parents, I want you to think about this. If your child is legitimately in need of something when they're young and they're asking you for it, what parent is going to be like, nah, sorry? If that is you, please do not say, I mean, I did that. (laughs) We will all judge you super hard right now. Just kidding. But we will. (laughs) But this idea and this thought is you don't have because you don't ask. I just want to like pause for a moment and go, when was the last time you asked God for something and just waited for his reply? Because the Bible is pretty clear on that too. You don't have it because you don't ask. So a lot of times like, man, why can I ever get ahead? Why can I ever do this? Have you ever asked? 
No, God knows what I need. (laughs) But look at the next verse. He goes, you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and don't receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. Oh, that's why I don't have it. Okay. (laughs) So there is a difference, church. My eight-year-old, which I had before, they're all older now, if they would come to me and go, Dad, listen, I have to get to the store. I have a project due tomorrow. Just let me drive. It'll be fine. I promise. I've watched you a lot for eight years now. I know what you're doing. I can do it fine. Okay. Go ahead, buddy. That would be the Horrible Parent of the Year Award. My child would crash before he left the driveway. It's a really short driveway. (laughs) It'd be a horrible idea, but he would not receive that request because, well, for one, he asked wrongly, he's eight, and for two, I would be a moron to hand him the car keys. And, but what he thought he needed, what I knew he needed was, how about you just get in the passenger seat and I'll take you to the store. No, I want to drive. I don't, I don't want to ride. I want to drive. This is a lot of times what we do. Because our Heavenly Father is like, no, I, I, I will get you there. Like, it's just not the way you're thinking. We're like, nah, no, nah. I'm going to drive. See, a lot of times in prayer, we're really confused because God only answers this one of three ways. You ready? Yes, no, not right now. Super simple. He doesn't really make this hard for us. Now, my youngest son is 17 and has his license. And when he says, Dad, can I have the car keys and go down here? I say, yes. You can. Hey, Dad, it's 3 in the morning. Can I go down here? No, you cannot. (laughs) As an 8-year-old, can I have the keys and go to the store? Not yet. Give it 8 years, and then yes. (laughs) Like You have to understand the understanding and the process of God because He knows what's better for you than you do, whether you realize that or not. And so what happens is there are sources and there's quarrelings and there's fights inside of us because we don't want to hear what he has to say a lot of times. We want to decide what we get and when we get it. So he goes on to say in the next verse, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? So whoever wants to be the friend of the world becomes the enemy of God. Now, every follower of Jesus in this room is like, I'm not an enemy of God. No, 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 no. I don't want to be that. But what I need you to see and I want you to understand is adultery is lusting after something that you can and shouldn't have. And if you have not found satisfaction in Jesus, you are lusting after the things of the world that you can or shouldn't have. Maybe God will bring them to you. But maybe he won't. And what this does is this causes all kinds of tension in us because we've always been told you can do what you want, you can have what you want, just go after it and get it. And Jesus is like, well, not in my economy. That's not how it works. Because you no longer are citizens of this world. You actually, your citizenship has been transferred to heaven. So that is where we are looking. And I promise you, I know it's better for you. So James has these harsh words that say, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Now, there's a lot of things we have to nuance out about this that we don't have time for, but let me just say this. Paul in Corinthians is talking to people like you sitting in this room who are followers of Jesus, and what he's saying is, hey, I'm telling you to hang around people that are not yet followers of Jesus. I didn't mean exclude yourselves completely. You would have to literally leave the planet, It's actually quite comical, this interchange. But this doesn't mean that you hide yourself away and you go buy 50 acres in the woods and you buy a storage container and you live underground and wait for Jesus to come back. That is not what this means. What this means is I have my idea of God. He directs my life. My life is surrendered to him. I live in the world. I obviously partake of things in the world and the people who need Jesus are the ones I'm around. Friendship with the world and a love towards the world that would make you an enemy of God is I have said, thank you for rescuing me and setting me free, but I like this much better. That would be hostility towards God. That would be us being friendship with the world. Now, let me just make a statement that might sting a bit. 
If you're believing and not following, I want you to know that that is what you're saying. Because believing in Jesus is not what he called us to do. He called us to follow. When people came and they said, Jesus, we like what you're doing. We want to follow you around. Read these passages. He tried to talk them out of following him. Okay, well, I don't even have a house. The birds do and the foxes do, but I don't. You still want to follow me? The guy that comes and he says, hey, I'm going to go back and I want to bury my father. And he goes, no, you let the dead bury the dead. You come and follow me now. Here's what that guy was saying. In this culture, if a person died that day, they were buried that day. That guy's dad was not dead. What he's saying is, let me go back. Let me live comfortably in my life. When all of that happens, I'll come back and follow. And Jesus is like, no, I want you to come. I want you to follow me now. So what I want you to hear, church, is believing is where this starts. I can't surrender in Jesus if I don't believe in him. But following is where this should rapidly go. So let's look at verse 5. Verse 5 says, Or do you think it's without reason that the Scripture says, The Spirit he made to dwell in us envies intensely. See, this is, I'm going to come back to that child thing again. Let's say that my son goes and he gets the keys and I'm asleep and he takes off and he crashes the car and he gets hurt and he hurts somebody else and he comes home and he's like, sorry, dad. There's going to be something inside of me that goes, why would you not trust that I know it's better for you? Why would you not trust me enough to tell you when I tell you no, it's to protect you? This is what it means when his spirit envies intensely. He's not jealous like we're jealous. We're sinful. What he is saying is like, why would you not trust me with your life? You trusted me in your salvation. Why would you not trust me now? See, he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. The Holy Spirit in your salvation lives inside of you, church. God in the spirit inside of you. Imagine the holy frustration that God must have when you're facing the things the world offers and you know they're going to let you down versus the things that he has given you and then you choose these temporary things. Imagine the frustration, the holy frustration inside of him to go, you have all the power inside of you. Why are you choosing these weak and worthless things of the world? And this is why this language is so harsh, because he wants to get our attention. Now look at verse 6. Verse 6 says, but he gives greater grace. Remember I made that statement? So here's what I want you to understand. If you have identified with everything that I have said already up to this point, you need to hear this statement, the loudest of anything I've said. But he gives more grace. You know what grace is? Grace is an undeserved favor. Grace is what you got in your salvation. Mercy is what you got in your salvation. So grace is an undeserved favor. I did not deserve salvation. Did you? No. So what I should have been given was I pay the penalty for my own sin, but instead Jesus gave me mercy, which means he didn't give me what I deserved. He actually paid that price. And when you come back here and maybe you're feeling like, oh my gosh, I have completely blown it as a follower of Jesus, he goes, but he gives more grace. Amen? Come on, people. This is like, okay, yes, I have blown it, but there's still a whole lot more grace for me. And this is what he wants you to go. Now, he's saying God is opposing the proud but gives grace to the humble. Here's what I want you to see. Have you ever seen the Heisman Trophy? Whoop. See that? I know I look just like the guy. This opposition of where God is opposing you, I want to give you a different visual, okay? So let's say that God is moving us in this direction. We are behind him. We're following him. We all of a sudden then say, you know what? The things of the world are pretty enticing, so we kind of move out next to him, and then we kind of start to move in front of him. And this whole idea of opposing the proud is us squared off against Jesus in a fight, I don't know if you know how then this movie ends. You don't win this fight, okay? But he gives grace to the humble. Now, he gives more grace, but tie these two things together. Who does he give it to? To the humble. 
not the prideful, not the ones who will sit and listen and go, that was good, and that stung a bit, but I like what I'm doing. Oh, no grace. If you believe him, you're still his son or daughter, but you leave knowing you're opposing him. And I need you to hear that. Because none of us want to be found fighting against God. I know the Lord is trying to do something great here with this group of people. And I need you to come to the reality of where you are to decide what you're going to do with this. For some of you, you live it. You're, you're pursuing spiritual formation. You're getting this grace right now. You're in a humble spirit following, and this isn't something that you struggle with. Praise God, man. But for some of you, I've described you to a T. You probably are feeling the weight of that right now. Your response right now is to go, Jesus, I'm sorry. I've lived for the world. I don't want to be opposed to you. Will you forgive me? He promises, yes, I will. He then says, now we have some work to do. See, you're standing out here and you're facing me now. The process of repentance is you walking back this way and coming back behind me and following me again. There's action involved here. Your, your statement today, if this is what you're going to realize in your life, is that you want that grace, you have to surrender, you have to forgive, or, or you have to confess your sin. The work begins when you leave, which is why we want communities to be so deep here, because we want you to be able to come and go, hey, I need help with this. I'm standing in front of God right now. I don't want to be there anymore. Would you help me walk the steps of repentance and walk away from the things that have turned my attention back towards the, the world? Church, what I need you to understand is your focus cannot be on how you've messed up. I'm confident you've already got that part if it's you. You have to focus on this now. He gives grace and who he gives that grace to. He goes on just a little bit more in verse 7. He says, therefore, here's our conjunction word, submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Imagine, I remember, I don't even know what I did, but man, it was something pretty bad. And I remember having to face my parents after it when I was a kid. I was terrified. I mean terrified. Caught red-handed, no way I could get out of it. And for most of us, that is the picture you have in your mind right now. But that is not the picture Jesus is painting right here. In fact, in Hebrews 4, he says, okay, you recognize you're a friend of the world, that you need to run back towards me. Look, here's the picture. Come on. Run. I'm here I'm ready to give you grace and mercy in your time of need to wrap you in my arms and forgive you and love on you. If you didn't get that picture growing up, then I'm sorry, but that's not who God is. He's like, right now in the worst moment of your life, Adam and Eve, because you're standing naked and you're hiding from me and you've made your own clothes, come out here. I don't want you to stay in your sin and shame. I've made clothes for you. I love you. This is your focus right now, church. So what I want you to understand is although you need to come to the reality of where you're at in your relationship with Jesus, this is what we're leaving focusing on, okay? Now, one of the things that we did last week, and we're going to end this way, is this spiritual breathing, okay? For some of you, you're like, I don't know what that means, but just listen to me and hang in here for a second. I want you to get to the point in your life as you're being spiritually formed like Jesus and you're becoming more like him that the Holy Spirit and your connection with him is a constant and ongoing thing. Now, one of the things that I didn't talk about last week and Pastor Doug and I were talking about this week is that the Navy SEALs, the most elite fighting force in the world, actually do what we practiced last week. 
when they're in the middle of a raging battle, nothing is going the way that it seems to be going. Their mission is now at a critical point and it's not going how they're going. They are actually taught to get out of the firefight, stop, and for five seconds, breathe in. And for five seconds, hold it. And for five seconds to breathe out, and then for five seconds to breathe back in. The most elite, fight, elite fighting force in the world is trained to do this. I think it's pretty good for us to do it too. Ours is just a little different. Let me read it to you. The basic idea is that we are living with a moment-by-moment -moment awareness of the Spirit until walking in the Spirit becomes as natural as breathing. The moment you become aware of sin in your life, you exhale. When you exhale, you breathe out and repent. I exhaled intentionally 45,000 times this week. I'm not even kidding. <laughs> because when you teach on spiritual warfare and you teach on spiritual formation and you're pulling people towards walking and becoming like Jesus, not just believing in him, the enemy is like, okay, we're going to see about this. And I guarantee those of you that took this serious, it happened to you too. So let's try this again. You ready? As I start to get tempted with sin, I go, everybody try it. Good. Then you inhale. When you inhale, you breathe in and you pray to be filled with the Spirit and you surrender control to Him. Do that. Breathe in. I want you to hear this statement. When the Holy Spirit moves in, there isn't much room for me. True story. One of our friends pulled out on Main Street right there and goes, <sighs> because the car cut him off. <laughs> I'm like, heck yeah, he's doing it right away. I love it. <laughs> Church, in order for us to follow what Jesus is having us do, you have to make these tough decisions. The question is, what are you going to do about this? Now, if you're in this room and you are not a follower of Jesus, here's what I want you to have heard. There is hope for everything you're searching for. It is not found in the world. By experience, it is found in Jesus, and I would love to have that conversation with you. So would some of our team who are going to be positioned right over there at those couches along the back wall. And we have people who are ready to sit and have these conversations with you, to pray with you, and to walk you on this journey. Because here's what I know, and I've lived the life that where you're sitting right now, I was actively searching for something to find purpose and passion in. I made the money I wanted to make, I had the job I wanted to have, and I was miserable as could be. When I realized Jesus was literally what I had been searching for and I surrendered my life to him, my life has never been the same again and I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. Now, for you, I'm sure there's a bit of a rub between you and I now because you don't think that Jesus is where all that's found. Just give us the opportunity to have that conversation with you, okay? So I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. The band's going to come up, and we're going to sing one more time, and we're going to wrap up this incredible teaching in James, how these words are so incredibly gracious but poignant at the same time. For those of you that are followers of Jesus, you have an incredible opportunity right now. You want to know why? Because God has said, okay, I brought you here today to hear this, because in fact, you have not been living your life the way that I want you to. That in itself, church, is an incredible grace. We want you to see that. Now, your responsibility is to sit before the Lord and confess. I'm going to give you some time to do that right now. Something like, God, I've made my life about me. I've pursued things of the world, not you. Will you please forgive me? I'm ready to walk away and start actually following you, Jesus. Now, if that's something that you prayed... I promise you, you do not want to do this alone. In fact, I'm confident that you can't. Please let one of us know. Hey, I, I confessed and I'm ready to walk away. 
let us walk with you. When an enemy comes and attacks a single person, it's a pretty easy takedown. When he attacks two or three or four walking together, it's not so easy. For those of you in this room that are not yet followers of Jesus, would you trust us with a conversation? If you don't want to get up and, and walk around during you know, this next time of singing, I get that. But would you grab one of us on your way out and just say, hey, can we just have a conversation about this? God, we love you. Holy Spirit, we thank you for moving today. Pray that we'd be able to understand that the devil doesn't make us do anything, God. These are our choices that we make. We love you, Lord, and we ask these things in your son's name. Amen.